The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So, um, today what we're going to do is continue our discussion of supply and demand. Uh, this is sort of uh, introduction week, if you will. We kind of talked about supply and demand, and you guys rightly immediately were on to where do those curves come from, and that's what we'll start next week. Uh, but what I want to do today is talk some more about what determines the shapes of supply and demand curves, and just thinking about an overview of how we think about supply and demand interacting in a market, and what determines uh, how responsive um, individuals and firms are to prices. So what we've talked about last time, and once again, remember everyone should have a handout. You should have picked up in the back on your way in. So everyone should have a handout. Um, we talked about last time was the sort of qualitative effects, the qualitative version of the supply demand model. We talked about what happens when a supply curve shifts, what happens when a demand curve shifts. We talked about how either a supply shock or demand shock could lead to the price to increase, but they could have very different effects on quantity, et cetera. Uh, what we didn't talk about is how big these effects are. I made up some numbers, I threw them on the graphs, but I didn't talk about where the size of those effects come from. And where they come from is the shapes of the supply and demand curve. And that's what we'll talk about today, is what determines the shapes of supply and demand curves. Okay, and that, that'll be the focus of today's lecture. Uh, I'll talk both about, theoretically, about what determines these shapes, and empirically, about how economists go about figuring out the shapes of supply and demand curves. So to think about this, let's start with um, figure 3-1, which is a standard kind of market diagram we had last time, which is you're in some initial equilibrium at point E1 with initial price P1 and a quantity Q1. That's the equilibrium that's stable because at that price P1, consumers demand Q1 units and suppliers are willing to provide Q1 units. So that's a stable equilibrium. Now we have some supply shift. Last time we talked about uh, somehow a pork specific drought. Okay? Uh, that leads the supply to shift inward. So supply curve rises to S2. At that new price, initially you would have excess demand. But quickly the price increases to shut off that excess demand. And you end up in a new equilibrium with a higher price, P2 and lower quantity Q2, a new equilibrium point E2. Okay? And we talked that through last time. What I want to talk about this time is, well, what determines the size of that shift from Q1 to Q2 and that price increase from P1 to P2? What's going to determine it is the elasticity of supply and demand. The elasticity of supply and demand is how much do supply and demand respond? Do the quantities supplied and the quantities demanded respond when the price changes? Say how when we say how elastic is demand, what we mean is how sensitive to price is the quantity demanded? Or alternatively, what is the slope of that demand curve? Okay? So the slope of the demand curve will be the sensitivity of quantity demanded to the price consumers face. And that will determine the market responsiveness. So to see this, the best way to see this in economics, it's always true the best way to think about things is to go to extremes. You have to remember extremes don't exist in the real world. okay? But it's a useful teaching device. Think about extremes. So let's think about one extreme case in figure 3.2. Let's think about the case of perfectly inelastic demand. Perfectly inelastic demand, that's where there's no elasticity of demand. What that means is that Demand for a good is unchanged regardless of the price. So perfectly inelastic demand is a case where demand for the good is unchanged regardless of the price. That would, that would lead you to have a vertical demand curve at a given quantity. What this says is regardless of the price, people always demand Q. Okay? Can anyone tell me um, what would cause demand to be perfectly inelastic? In what types of situations? Would demand be inelastic? It's never perfectly inelastic. Would demand be relatively inelastic? Yeah? It's all about substitutes. When there's no substitutes, when there's nowhere to go, it doesn't matter what the price is. 
Okay? When there's no substitutes, demand will be perfectly inelastic because you have to have Q. It doesn't matter uh, what the price is because there's, no, there's nowhere else you can spend. There's no substitute for that good. So if you want an amount Q of that good for any reason, you're always going to want that amount Q no matter the price. So perfectly inelastic good would have no substitutes and so you'd always want Q no matter what. Can anyone think of an example? There's no perfectly inelastic good in the world, but what sorts of goods? Yeah? Medicines. Medicines. Uh, now, not necessarily all medicines. So, so give me an example of a medicine which would be more and less inelastic. So, it, it, you know, I mean, I the medical name. What sort of treatments? Yeah, something which is sort of life saving. The best thing we often use is insulin for diabetics. Diabetics that not get that insulin to manage your diabetes will die. That seems like that's something where there's not a whole lot of substitutes. Substitute is dying. Okay? So basically, that's where demand should be relatively inelastic. Or heart transplant, when you get a heart transplant or any kind of transplant, you have, you have medicine you take that, so you don't reject the transplanted organ. That sort of medicine demand should be very inelastic. Elastic drug, well, our favorite example is always Viagra. Okay? Something where you know, you'd think that kind of you can probably survive without it, uh, and that basically it would, it, that people would want less Viagra if you charged a lot more for it than if you charged less for it. So elasticity is going to be about substitutability, okay? And that's going to determine inelastic demand. Now, what happens with inelastic demand when there's a supply shock? When supply increases, what happens? Well, in that case, there can never be excess demand because demand doesn't change. So all that happens is price just increases. If there's, if there's inelastic demand and the supply shock, then all that happens is an increase in price and no change in quantity. Okay, so inelastic demand, quantity doesn't change from a price increase. Price just goes up. From a supply shock, price just goes up. Now let's consider the, alter the, the opposite. Let's look at figure 3.3. Three. And think about perfectly elastic demand. Perfectly elastic demand is demand where consumers essentially don't care about the quantity, they just care about the price. That is, there are infinitely good substitutes. A per perfectly elastically demanded good is one where there are essentially perfect substitutes. An inelastic good is where there's no substitute. A perfectly elastic good would be this perfect substitute. Literally, you are a, technically, if, the demand, if a good is perfectly elastically demanded, then you are completely indifferent between that good and a substitute. Well, if you're completely indifferent, then if the price changed at all, you would immediately switch. And so the price can't change. Okay? What's an example? Once again, there's no good, uh, there's no good example of a perfectly elastic. What's something? Yeah. What? Candy. Candy. Okay. So you've got your Wrigley's gum. You know, you've got your, I, I like this sugar-free minty gum. You've got Orbitz and Eclipse. Okay. And I go to the store and they're all pretty much the same price. If Orbitz was more than Eclipse, I just buy Eclipse. They're the same. They're minty gum. Okay. It doesn't make a difference. Okay. So basically the price is the same. And so basically if Eclipse tried to, if there's a supply shock, let's say, I don't know, they're made with the same shit, but let's say that like Eclipse has some magic ingredient, okay? And let's say the Eclipse magic ingredient got more expensive, so the supply curve shifted up, okay? Well, Eclipse could not respond by raising its price because I just switched to Orbitz, okay? Or we often think of McDonald's and Burger King. Now they're less perfect substitutes, but pretty perfect. If McDonald's started charging 10 bucks for a hamburger, you wouldn't go there anymore. Okay, you go to Burger King. Okay, so basically, if they, if this, so if there's supply shock to one provider in a perfectly, in a, to a provider that's facing a perfectly elastic demand curve, they cannot raise their price because people just switch, so quantity will fall a lot. Because if I'm supplying Eclipse gum, okay, and suddenly costs a lot more to produce Eclipse gum, but I can't raise my price because I lose all my business to Orbitz, I'm just going to sell, I'm just going to produce a lot less Eclipse because I, I'm losing money now. So, the quanti so in, with perfectly inelastic demand, the quantity didn't change. With perfectly elastic demand, we saw a big quantity change. Okay? So more generally, what determines the quantity change in response to a price change is the elasticity. More generally, we're between these two cases, a perfectly elastic and perfectly inelastic.
And what matter, what's going to determine the price change is going to be the price elasticity of demand, epsilon, which is going to be the percentage change in quantity for each percentage change in price. Okay? Or for those, or in calculus terms, dq, dp. Okay? So basically, the percentage change in quantity for the percentage change in price. So for example, if for every 1% increase in price, quantity falls 2%, that is a price elasticity of demand of minus 2. Okay? The price elasticity of demand is the percentage change in quantity for the percentage change in price. Okay? So inelastic demand is an epsilon of 0. There's no change in quantity when price changes. Perfectly elastic demand is an epsilon of negative infinity. Any epsilon change in price leads to a negative infinite change in quantity. Immediately quantity goes to 0 if you try to raise your price. So price elastic demand will typically be between 0 and negative infinity. And the larger it is, the more, elast the more quantity will change when prices change. OK? Questions about that? Yeah? Um, so that formula shouldn't be dqdp times p over q, because dqdp just refers to the change of the quantity with respect to price, not necessarily the percent change. Uh, yeah, you're right. I try to get too fancy with my calculus. You're right. Let's just stick with the non-calculus formula. I never should deviate from my notes. Uh, so let's just stick with the non-calculus formula. OK, so basically, other questions about this? OK, so basically, that's the elasticity. Uh, that's going to be the, the, um, the elasticity. Now, an interesting point about elasticity is now we're not going to get into producer theory for a couple of lectures. But as a, as a little peek ahead about producer theory, let's think about how elasticity determines the money that producers make from selling their goods. Well, when a producer sells, if a producer sells Q goods at a price P, they make revenues R. Revenues are the price times the quantity. Okay? The amount of money a producer makes okay, um, when it sells goods, it's revenues. This isn't its profits. We're not talking about profits. Just the amount of money it makes, not the amount of money it takes home at the end of the day. I'm ignoring the cost of making the goods. The amount of total revenues it makes is price times quantity. Okay? Well, we can then say that the change in revenues with respect to price okay, is what? It's Q plus DQ plus delta Q, let me put it this way to make, to make my math clearer, plus P times delta Q over delta P. Okay? That's how revenues change with respect to price. Or in other words, plugging in from the elasticity formula, okay, delta R delta P equals Q times 1 plus epsilon. Okay? So in other words, what this says is that what if you're a producer and you're trying to decide whether to raise your price, well, that will increase revenues. It all depends on the elasticity. If the elasticity is between 0 and minus 1, then raising prices will raise revenues. If the elasticity is greater than minus 1, then raising prices will lower revenues. Okay? So it's always you're often faced with the issue of sort of, gee, why did they charge this much for this good, or should they raise their price or not raise their price? Well, that's all about the elasticity of demand. Okay? The elasticity of demand will determine whether they're going to make more money by raising their price or lose money by raising their price. For Eclipse Gum, their elasticity demand is well above minus 1 in absolute value, so they're going to lose money by raising their price. If they take the current level of Eclipse, for every, for every penny they raise it, they'll lose money. Okay? For Insulin, for every penny they raise it, they'll make money. Okay? And then you might say, well, gee, then how come the price of Insulin is at infinity and the price of Eclipse Gum isn't zero? Well, that's what we'll talk about in a few weeks, because it also depends on the cost of producing it. Okay? But at the end of the day, that's, that's what's going to determine the money that's made by producers when they change their prices. OK? Questions about that? OK. So now, that's, that's how we think about 
the shape of supply and demand. The shape of supply and demand is determined by these elasticities. So now we have to get into, OK, well, where do we get these elasticities from? And that is the main topic of, um, of empirical economics. which is estimating these kinds of elasticities, estimating these types of elasticities. OK? Um, so one of the, one of the first uh, distinctions I drew in the lecture was between theoretical economics and empirical economics. Theoretical economics can tell us, gee, this is what a graph looks like, and supply and demand. But it can't really tell us. Theoretical economists can't really tell us how big, for example, an elasticity is going to be. It can tell us, gee, there's more substitutes or less substitutes, so we can sort of rank them. We, can think, we know the elasticity for Eclipse gum has got to be higher than the elasticity for insulin. Okay? But we, from the theoretical model, we can't say what the elasticity actually is. To say what an elasticity actually is, we need to go to an empirical model. We actually need to bring data to bear on the question. And this is very difficult, because here we face the fundamental conundrum facing the empirical economists, which is distinguishing causation from correlation. And the whole guts of empirical economics is all about this question, distinguishing causation from correlation. Okay? The classic story that illustrates this, it's due to my colleague Frank Fisher from a textbook many years ago, is the story of uh, in, Ru in ancient Russia, there was a cholera outbreak, and many people were dying. So the government decided to send doctors out to try to solve the problem. And where there were more people sick, they sent more doctors. Well, the peasants said, wait a second. We observe that where there's more doctors, more people are dying from cholera. So the doctors must be causing the cholera. So they rose up and killed the doctors. Okay. The peasants confused causation with correlation. Okay? They thought that the fact that you saw more people dying with there's more doctors meant that doctors were causing the disease. Clearly that's wrong. That's why they were peasants. Okay? Now, but it's not just peasants that make this mistake. Okay? For example, in 1988, Harvard University, our illustrious neighbor to the south, I guess, west, east, I don't know which way is Harvard. I don't know directions. Down the street. Okay? Uh, <laughs> A Harvard University dean conducted an interview with a set of freshmen. And they found that those that had taken SAT preparation courses, now you all took SAT preparation courses, but 1988 not everyone did. Okay? Those who had taken SAT preparation courses okay, scored an average of 63 points lower. This was back when SAT was 1,600 points. 63 points lower on their SATs than those that had not taken preparation courses. The dean concluded that preparation courses were unhelpful and that the testing industry was preying on the insecurities of students to provide a useless service. Okay? Why was the dean confusing causation with correlation? What did the dean get wrong in drawing that conclusion? Yeah. Um, what had probably happened is the students who got worse scores realized that they wanted to try and improve their scores by taking an SAP prep class. So that's why there was a uh, lower average score for the people who had taken the class. Generally, the people who were needed to help the most took the most courses. And so they had an underlying lower score. So in fact, you can't tell anything from the fact that the people who took the prep course scored worse. It's just the fact that um, it's, it's, it's just another excellent example of confusing causation with correlation. Okay? Um, and that is, uh, that's another example. Another example I like quite a lot is um, studies of breastfeeding. Okay? There are numbers of studies of breastfeeding, uh, especially in developing countries, where they found that uh, the longer children were breastfed, the sicker they were. So they concluded that breastfeeding was bad for kids. Okay? Well, that's not the truth. The truth is the sicker kids need to be breastfed more because breastfeeding is actually good for kids. Okay? And they just, got the they just confused the causation with the correlation. Now, these are all fun examples. But the truth is, this is a common mistake made by citizens, policymakers, everyone in the real world.
is taking two things that move together and assuming one causes the other. And this is the fundamental conundrum facing empirical economics and trying to address these kinds of things like measuring elasticities. Okay? So to understand that, let's think about the, the issue of trying to estimate the elasticity of demand for pork. Let's say you have the exciting job of estimating the elasticity of demand for pork. That's your assignment. Well, you say, what, you say, well, wait a second. What we learned in class, as shown in figure 3-4, is that the price of pork can rise for very different reasons. Figure 3-4, we start initial equilibrium like E1, okay, with a quantity like Q1 and a price like P1. Okay? Now, imagine that there was a shift in demand because the price of beef rose, remember? The price of beef rose, that shift demand from D1 to D2. What did that lead to? A higher price and a higher quantity. So if you took that diagram, forget the supply shift for a minute, just imagine that's the change. And you said, aha, I can measure the elasticity. I see here there's a change in price. I can then look at how quantity changed, and I'll get the elasticity, right? After all, it's delta Q over Q, delta P over P. So I just look, I take Q2 prime minus Q1 over Q1, that's the percentage change in Q. I take P2 over P1 over P1, that's the percentage change in price, and what do I get? A wrong signed elasticity is what I get. I get a positive elasticity, because Q's going up and P's going up. Okay? Why? because I'm confusing causation with correlation. It's not the price change that caused quantity to change. In fact, it's the opposite. It's a taste shift which caused quantity increase which drove up the price. Okay? It was a demand increase which caused the quantity demanded to increase which drove up the price. So it's the quantity driving the price, not the price driving the quantity. So if you looked at that simple example, as many people in the real world would do, they'd say, hey, look, higher prices cost higher quantities. You're getting the wrong answer because you did not, you're confusing correlation, which is, gee, the higher price is correlated with the higher quantity because there was a common factor causing both of them, which is the demand shift, okay, and not causation. The higher price did not cause the higher quantity. So what do we, what do we, what do we need to do? We need to distinguish why the price increased. We need to distinguish why the price increased to measure this. Okay? If, if instead we looked at a shift in supply, okay, such as the case from shifting from S1 to S2 and moving the equilibrium from E1 to E2, then you would get the right answer. Because then you'd say, look, something independent to consumers shifted up the price. Some shock to the supply of pork shifted up the price. And we saw that their quantity fell as a, response, as a result. Okay? What's the key? The key is that to measure an elasticity of demand, you're measuring the slope of the demand curve. So you need to shift along a demand curve, not shift the demand curve itself. So if you look at this figure, what's the, what's the concept we want? We want the slope of the demand curve. Okay? Well, you get that by shifting from E1 to E2, because you shift along the demand curve. So by looking at what happens to quantity as price rises from E1 to E2, you get the slope of the demand curve. You get that delta Q over delta P you want. But from E1 to E2 prime, you're not shifting along a demand curve. You're, you're actually measuring the elasticity of supply. Right? You're measuring elasticity of supply. You're shifting along a supply curve. So you're actually answering a different question. A relevant question, but a different one. That question is, what's the elasticity of supply? How willing are pork producers to supply pork as the price goes up? So it's the same delta Q over delta P, but the, here we did the elasticity of demand. There's a corresponding elasticity of supply, which is the, measured the same way. Okay, It's delta Q over delta P, but it's for a different kind of shock. It's what you get from moving along the supply curve. So from E1 to E2 prime, we can use that to measure the elasticity of supply or the slope of the supply curve. 
And we do that if something shifts demand to move us along the supply curve. From E1 to E2, we measure the elasticity of demand as, we sh as something shifts supply and moves us along the demand curve. Okay? So what we need to measure the elasticity of demand is something which shifts supply but does not itself affect demand. Okay? And the best example of this that we use in economics, a great example, is government policy, which comes along and changes the supply conditions for a good. So for example, let's think about a tax on pork. So if you go to the next figure 3-5, imagine the government came along and taxed pork. Okay? The government comes along and taxes pork. Let's think about what a tax on pork does. The government comes along, and let's say the pork market is initially in equilibrium at $3.30 with 220 million kilograms of pork sold. Now the government comes along and says that it's going to charge $1.05 in tax for every kilogram of pork. So it's going to impose a tax of $1.05 per kilogram on producers. So it's saying to producers of pork, for every kilogram of pork you sell, you have to send a check to the government for $1.05. OK? For every kilogram of pork you sell, you have to send a check to the government for $1.05. OK? Now, somebody talk me through how a supplier thinks through that policy. How does a supplier react to that? What do they think? OK, they're initially happy, remember, at E1 selling 220 million kilograms at 330. Okay. What happens when the government comes in and says, you have to pay $1.05 for every kilogram of pork you sell? What happens? Yeah? Um, the producer decides that the current amount of money they have will not be able to buy as much product, uh, inputs to create their products so they can produce less. Exactly. So, so in other words, the cost of producing just rose. So, so, so what do they do? So in other words, what they say is, look, effectively, if I was happy before selling 220 million kilograms at 330, to keep me equally happy selling 220 million kilograms, I'm going to have to raise the price. We should add this to the graph, actually. If you draw a vertical line up from E1 to the S2 curve, draw a little dashed line up from the E1 to the S2 curve and then over, that price intersection Will be three will be four thirty five. So in other words, if you want me to keep producing two hundred and twenty million kilograms of pork, I'm going to have to get four thirty five a kilogram. Now you might say, what gives you the right to get that? And it's not about rights; it's about what producers are willing to do. That same mathematics, that same supply curve, that tells us they're willing to sell two hundred twenty million kilograms of three thirty says if you want them to keep selling 220 million kilograms but also pay a buck five to the government, they're going to have to get 435 a kilogram. Okay? So what happens is it's that's a supply shift. And with the same reaction we saw last time with the drought, the price goes up, consumers demand less, and you reach a new equilibrium at the price E2. You reach a new equilibrium where you sell 206 million kilograms. Okay? for a price of $4. So someone tell me how I use this example to find the elasticity of demand. Yeah? In this case, you know that the uh, change in price traveled along the demand slope. Yeah. So you know that it's not, it's not supply, so you just need to change your price. With these two points, you can right. so OK, so, so tell me. So how would I, you don't have to do the math in your head, but how would I, well, how would I compute it? OK, so you take E1, E2, and then you will give us the price or the quantity change. Right, exactly. So, so the quantity change, delta Q over Q, Q over Q, is what? It's 14 over 220. It's minus 14 over 220. It fell by 14 million kilograms over 220. The price change, OK, delta P over P, OK, is uh, the price rose from 330 to $4. So the price change is 70 cents over 330 cents, OK? And using those, you get that um, you end up with 
a price elasticity of minus 0.3. Or in other words, there's a 21% change, there's a 6.4% change in quantity. This is minus 6.4% for a 21% change in price. So quantity falls by 6.4% when price goes up by 21%. That's a price elasticity of minus 0.3. Or that's a relatively inelastic demand. It's not perfectly inelastic, but it's relatively inelastic. In other words, at that point, pork producers could make money by raising the price. Now you might say, well, gee, why didn't they? That's something we'll discuss in a couple weeks. Okay. But at that point, demand was relatively inelastic. And you got a convincing estimate because you moved along that demand curve, used the supply shift. Now, we're going to talk about taxation much, much later in the semester. Um, let me just talk for one minute about what we learned from this graph. What happens? Well, the shaded area is the money the government raises from its tax. The government has a tax of $1.05 at 206 million kilograms. So it raises $1.05 times 206 million kilograms, which is that shaded area. Two points to note that we'll come back to later in the semester. First point to note, the amount of money the government raises will depend directly on the elasticity of demand. Can anyone tell me how much money the government would raise if you had a perfectly inelastic demand? Yeah. Right. It, so basically, if you but if you if if we think about this demand curve being perfectly flat, okay. If we think about this demand curve being perfectly flat, then basically um, the producer can't charge any more for their good, right? So the producer it's going to depend on whether the producer is willing to sell at a dollar five less and how much less they're willing to sell. They're willing to sell a lot less. They're going to make a lot less money. It's going to be where that, it's going to be where that second supply curve intersects a flat demand curve. So that quantity is going to be a lot smaller when I'm on the diagram. But you see where that dashed line at $3.30 intersects S2. That's way to the left. Quantity is going to fall a ton in this market. When quantity falls, the government's going to raise a lot less money, right? Because the government raised $1.05 on every unit sold at the end. So if the government taxes goods in very elastically demanded, very elastically demanded goods, it's going to raise less money. If it taxes inelastically demanded goods like insulin, it's going to raise more money because the quantity doesn't change. So you, yeah. Cigarettes are yes, exactly. Cigarettes are relatively inelastic. The elasticity is around minus 0.5. So the government will actually raise money raising the raising the cigarette tax. Okay. Whereas, let's take, everyone says, look, we all think we're good, we're good kind of, those of good liberals think we should tax yachts. Let's tax yachts. Only rich guys have yachts. Okay? The problem is yachts are incredibly elastically demanded. So you raise a lot less money taxing yachts than you think, because guys buy fewer yachts, okay? and you don't raise as much money as you think it would. You still raise some, and it still may be worth it, but you raise less than you think. So that's one, one, sort, of, um, one sort of observation uh, about this is that basically how much money you'll raise will be a function of how elastic the, um, the demand is. The other important observation to make is why it's actually hard for governments to figure out how much money they're going to raise for a tax. Because to figure it out, they need to know these elasticities. That is the naive thing to do would have been to say what? Well, we're selling 220 million kilograms of pork. That's a buck five. We're going to tax each kilogram. So it's 220 million times a buck five, and that's how much money we raise. Well, that's wrong, we know, because that assumes inelastic demand. If demand's elastic, they'll raise less than that. Well, if we want to figure out how much a government's going to raise from a tax, they've got to know what these elasticities are. And those are actually pretty hard things to know. So that's why there's uncertainty. That's why when politicians will say, this tax will raise x, and you'll hear the New York Times report, the tax will raise x, that is a guess. Okay? Those are guesses because they depend on our best estimate of the key elasticities to determine how people respond. Yeah? It's, well, some claim you do. You don't actually. But some claim you have tax cuts that raise money. That's because they think the elasticity is very large. If the elasticity is large enough, 
a tax cut can raise money, right? So basically, that's all about that some people think that elasticities are large enough that tax cuts can raise money. Those people are wrong, but that's what they claim. OK? Yeah? Can the elasticity depend on the quantity in exchange? Yes, excellent point. You'll go through that in section on Friday. So what I've done is I've done an example of a constant elasticity curve. Actually, I've done something here which is logically inconsistent. This curve is linear, which means it can't be constant elasticity. <coughs> Right? If, it's, if constant elasticity would have to, be a, would have to, would have to curve. Okay? So I've, ta I've done, what I've e estimated here is a local elasticity. I have estimated the elasticity around that price change. But the elasticity, if this curve is true, would, would be different at different points on this curve. Right? If the elasticity is going to be constant all over the curve, you need a constant elasticity demand, that's going to be a curve that bends, not a curve that's uh, not, a, not a linear curve. So a linear demand curve is not constant elasticity in demand. We will typically ignore that issue and focus on local elasticities. But that is an important issue. We'll discuss that in section on Friday, the difference between constant elasticity demand curves and linear demand curves. Uh, but typically, we're thinking about local changes. So it does, if it's local enough, it doesn't really matter. But for a broad change, it will matter what the shape of the curve is. Good point. Other questions? OK. Let me then turn to. Another problem we face in empirical economics. Okay, so this is an example of a problem we face in empirical economics. Okay, let me turn to an example of another problem we face in empirical economics estimating elasticities, which is that individuals often choose the price they face. Okay, individuals typically don't face, often don't just face a price that's given to them, and they can say, okay, they're given a price and we can see how they respond. They often choose the price they face. Let me, see what, let me explain what I mean for that. A class by that, a class example of an elasticity that matters a lot for policy is the elasticity of demand for medical care. The elasticity of demand for medical care. That is, how much less medical care will you use if you have to pay for it? So for example, most of us have insurance through MIT or maybe through our parents. And the way health insurance works is you pay a certain amount per month, or your parents do. And in return, that health insurance covers the cost of your medical care, most of it. But typically, you have to pay some of it. So how many people have gone to the doctor in the last six months? How much did you have to pay something? How much did you pay? Did you pay a co-payment? No? None of you? Yeah, how much did you pay? Uh, $20. $20, $10, $5. That's what's called a co-payment, or zero. Most insurance these days has what's called co-payments. A co-payment is what you pay when you go to the doctor. Okay, insurance picks up the rest. You don't know. You didn't know how much the whole doctor visit cost. You just went. You gave them your card. They said your copayment's 20. You gave them 20. You don't know the visit might have cost 100, 200, 500 thousand dollars. You don't know. Your insurer picks up the rest. You pay the copayment. Okay, copayments are on, rapidly on the rise. Okay, in health insurance, there's a rapid rise in copayments. Increasingly, insurers are saying, look, healthcare costs are out of control. One way we're going to combat them is by making people bear more of the costs that they use. Okay? I go on forever, but I'm a healthcare economist. I got a healthcare forever. But just to, just to fix ideas, okay, and why this is an issue. In 1950, okay, the US, the US economy spent 5% of our gross domestic product, 5% of our size of our economy went to healthcare. Today it's 17%. By 2075, it's projected to be 40%. That is, of every dollar that's made in America, 40 cents will go to medical care. By 100 years later, it's about 100%. Literally, if we do nothing, the entire economy will be health care. OK, obviously, that can't happen. We've got to deal with this. And one way that insurers and some policymakers are saying we need to deal with this is we need to make consumers bear more of the cost of their medical care. We need to make consumers pay more when they go to the doctor so that they understand the consequences of their decision. OK? Well, if we're going to do that, a key question we need to know is, well, does it affect their behavior? Okay, if make consumers pay more, doesn't it all affect their demand for medical care? It's just a tax on them, essentially. Then that's different than if it causes them to use less medical care. Maybe good, maybe bad. We'll come back to that. But the key empirical question is, what is the elasticity of demand for medical care? If you pay 20 and you pay 0, okay, how much less likely are you to use the doctor? when you pay 20 versus when you pay 0. Well, we can all introspect this and think about it. But in fact, the, to answer this, we have to go to the data and ask, well, what's the difference? 
So people for many years went to the data and they said, look, there's all sorts of differences out there across people in what they pay for their copayments. Some people have insurance where they pay nothing, some where they have 20. Some people have what they call high deductible plans. A deductible plan is where you pay the full cost of your visits until you reach some limit. So a $2,000 deductible plan will be one where you pay all your medical costs until you spent $2,000. It's a big copayment. So we look across those people, and people did, and they found, look, the people that have plans where they spend more for health care, where they have a high copayment, use a lot less health care than when they don't have to spend anything. The elasticity of demand looks very, very high. Okay? What is wrong with those studies? What is, wrong, how could, what is wrong with the conclusion those people drew? They drew it by comparing people who had plans where they paid a lot to go to the doctor and therefore and use a lot less care to people who didn't pay anything when they went to the doctor and used a lot more care. I picked the $20 person, so I picked him already. Um, so I probably just they chose to have higher deductible or like the high deductible plans because they don't often go to the doctor already. The rational choice, if you're young and healthy, for almost everyone in this room, is going to be a very high deductible, high copayment plan. Because the, it will cost you less money, because the insurer is shifting the money to you, but you don't use the doctor anyway, so who cares? Okay? So the healthier people are going to choose the plans where they pay more. So of course you're going to find in the plans where people pay more, they use more, people pay more, they use less medical care. But, it's, but is it because they're paying more or is it because healthy guys choose those plans? It's causation versus correlation. We don't know. Well, how can we figure that out? Well, if we were doctors, what we do, real doctors, not a doctor like me, a real doctor, a medical doctor, okay? What we do is we run a randomized trial. So if doctors want to figure out whether a drug works or not, they don't just look at guys who take the drug versus guys who don't. They run a randomized trial. They randomly assign some people to take the drug and some people not. Now when you run a randomized trial, by definition, you get a causal effect. Because if, let's take this, well, this room isn't quite big enough. We all know the law of large numbers. You know, but imagine, this, imagine there were four times as many people in this room or five times as many people in this room. Okay? And I had you come up to the front, I flipped a coin, and said half of you are going to take the drug and half of you are not. Okay? Randomly, by the flip of a coin. Then by definition, any statistically noticeable differences I get between the group that takes the drug and the group that doesn't is caused by the drug. And how do I know that? because I know the groups are otherwise identical by the law of large numbers. By the law of large numbers, I know that as long as I have enough people, okay, they're identical. So if the only difference between them is that one's taking the drug and one's not. Okay? That's a randomized trial. That would be how I could solve the causation versus correlation problem. Because all, in medicine, they're running thousands of randomized trials every day are being run. Okay? In fact, the FDA, before it'll approve a drug, will typically require a randomized trial. Well, in the social sciences, it's harder to run randomized trials because we're actually trying to understand things like how people's med demand for medical care, not whether drug works or not. But in fact, one of the most famous social randomized trials in history was called the RAND Health Insurance Experiment, run in the 1970s, where some innovative health economists who understood this problem that we laid out about the fact you can't just compare more and less generous health insurance policies, actually randomized health insurance policies across people. They recruited volunteers. And they literally said, we're going to randomize. Some people are going to have policies where the health care is free. And some people are going to have policies where they have to pay essentially all the costs of health care. Okay. So they essentially randomized across these different groups. And therefore, they could assess what the price elasticity was. Because any, they knew the price difference between groups. For one, the price was 0. For one, the price was 1. They actually had a range of prices they varied it across. They could look at the quality response, and they knew that was a quantity response to the price because people weren't choosing their prices. The price were being assigned to them. What did they find? Well, they found that medical demand is elastic, although not as elastic as those previous studies. is somewhat elastic, not as elastic as the previous studies found. They found, a, they found that the elasticity demand for medical care is around minus 0.2. So when the price goes up, people use less medical care, but not that much less. Okay? Now, let's be clear. Remember what elasticity is? That's delta Q over Q. The same study showed that if you take someone who paid nothing, 
and make them pay almost, almost everything, their utilization of Medicare falls by 45%. That's consistent with that small elasticity because that's a huge delta P, percent delta P. Okay, so basically, the, you know, basically that comes to question about local versus global elasticities. So it's not saying the prices don't matter, but it's not a, it's not a very very elastically demanded good. So that's how they measure that price elasticity demand. That has become the central that experiment, which was run almost you know over 35 years ago now. That result drives much of what we do in health policy. So a lot of the estimates that we saw for the recently passed health reform bill derived from how do we get that estimate? We have to figure out how people are going to respond with their medical care when we give them health insurance. The recently passed health care bill just gave 32 million people health insurance. Well, how are they going to respond to having health insurance? We go back to the RAND, we go back to the RAND estimates and say, well, we have this elastic demand. We know what we're doing to the price. We figure out how much more medical care is going to go up, how much medical care is going to go up. Okay? But here's the other thing. Here's the question, here's the question let's close with. Is that a good thing or a bad thing that medical care fell when the price went up? And how would we tell whether it's a good thing or a bad thing? So we know when we raise the price, people use less medical care. How can we tell if that's a good thing or a bad thing? In the same experiment, how could we tell? What could we do? Yeah? I mean, you look at, like, I guess, death rates or, like, you know. You look at their health. You say, look. We ha the same trial can answer a different question. We know that when you charge them more for healthcare, they use less. Well, are they sicker? The answer, not at all. People use less healthcare and we're no sicker. Okay? Why? Because we waste a huge amount of healthcare in the US. Okay? A huge amount of healthcare is wasted. So in fact, we could cut back quite a lot on healthcare and we'd be no sicker. And that's what the RAND experiment showed, that we can charge people to use medical providers. And they'll use less medical care, and they won't be sicker as a result, which suggests that actually, as we try to think about getting our health care costs under control in America, making people pay something to go to the doctor is not a crazy thing to be thinking about. How much? Well, that depends on efficiency versus equity. We can't make someone who has no income pay $1,000 to go to the doctor. That clearly is a mistake. But we can take a rich guy like me and make me pay 50 bucks to go to the doctor. That's, there's no reason not to do that. Okay? So basically, that's a lesson of how he's the last his demand to help inform the kind of policies we need to make. Okay, let me stop there. By the way, if you'd all find this stuff interesting and you haven't yet read Freakonomics, how many of you have read Freakonomics? Jeez, that's amazing. Okay, if you haven't read Freakonomics, you should. It's a great book. If you're lazy, the movie's coming out. And Freakonomics, the movie, is premiering on Friday the 30th uh, at LSC. So if you're interested in learning more about empirical tools and economics, you can watch Freakonomics the movie on Friday the 30th.